Hello, everyone. Welcome to Courage Bacchus. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, I have a very important special guest here. I have Maxim Fomachev. And he is a highly skilled mime actor and clown. I'm so excited to have him here today. I hope you're ready to find out a little bit more about Maxim. So let's start with your background. Uh, how did you get into mime acting and clown work? Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely, and hello everyone. My beginning uh, was at the age of 12. I was born in Russia, in Moscow, and I watched television, however, we didn't have captioning at that time, and there was no captioning on the television programming. Happened one day, though, that I was watching a mime show, and I understood everything that the artist was doing. I couldn't believe it. I was just taken by it, and I started to copy this mime artist, and I was recognized, and that just went from there, and I became a professional mime artist. Wow. At the age of 12, getting involved in mime artistry, and then uh, getting to where you are now, without captioning, uh, just almost impossible to understand anything like that. Thankfully, we do have that captioning now. So Maxim, I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit uh, about your training as a mime artist and clown. When my mom saw me doing my performances, she started to call around and see where I could go and get some professional training. There was one place that specialized in training children. I did attend a school where I was learning how to speak, not using sign language. I did use devices like hearing aids. I attended this mime artist school, and a teacher said to my mom, you know, Maximum, I think he's far too good for our group. He's far surpassed our kids. I think he should get into adult training. So my mother said, okay, fine, I gotta start making some more calls, which she did. And she found a professional theater group at a university in Moscow. And they said, well, let's come and take a look at this guy. So I showed up, I was 13 years old, made my introductions and they thought, well, even though this kid is deaf, we're gonna give him a chance. I went through a number of different performances at the circ level and people were really, really impressed. And from then on, I was brought in as a professional and got more and more training. When I turned 16, I decided that, you know, I had to make a decision. Am I going to identify using sign language or am I going to be a guy who uses spoken language? And I did find eventually that I wanted to identify as a deaf mime artist. I found a troupe. And I also found that there were a lot of techniques that I was learning from the spoken language people and different techniques learning from the sign language people. So I professionalized or studied in both and I also went off to university in Moscow. And at that time, that was under the communist government regime, but President Gorbachev actually was instrumental in providing equal access to deaf citizens in Russia in terms of education and whatnot. And there were 300 deaf artists who were chosen. Eventually, it was narrowed down to 15, and I was within that wow. group. So I spent five years studying professionally, acting. No mime, no clown work, but just professional acting. When I went back into the field, I continued to perfect my skill of clown work and mime, mime artistry. I'll try and keep it short. Oh, wow. That is a lot of hard work, but it seems like it has definitely paid off for you now. Really an impressive performer we have here. Interesting how uh, you had studied both with uh, non-deaf people and people who were signing deaf people, and just the differences you noticed between the two groups and how they used some facial expressions. Really interesting. Hopefully you can come back and do a performance for us someday. I wanted to ask you as well, I'm wondering what your biggest challenge was uh, getting into Cirque du Soleil. Uh, you're in that oh, Algeria Allegria, show, Allegria. Al Allegria show. So I'm wondering if you can just tell us about those challenges. At the Cirque du Soleil, where 
I worked, uh, I think initially, the first show was Alegria. And I was totally amazed. I'd never seen anything like that. I had done similar Cirque du Soleil work in Russia, but this level of Cirque du Soleil was uh, incredibly beautiful. The mime, the artistry, the costuming, and, and the, the stage work, I thought, this is my dream job. And I heard that there was auditions uh, going on for the Cirque du Soleil. And I attended, and I drove the distance to California. When I got there, uh, the auditions began at 8.30, and there were 40 people who were scheduled that day. It ended at later in the afternoon, and they selected four people. My audition went very well, and it was very difficult. And I knew that I was coming in there as the, own, the sole deaf person, but I may, managed to do very really well. Nothing unfortunately happened. I wasn't called in. I was told that that will happen eventually. And in 2010, I got a call to go back to Vancouver and try out in Vancouver, which I did. So again, same number of auditions, highly competitive. I did a very good job. I, I was given you know, a pass. I was called to see whether or not I would be interested in doing clown work for the show Alegria. I was over, over the moon. And when I was told that the, the show was about clowning in this particular episode or this particular piece, I was like, sign me up, I'm right there. So I signed up for a six month contract. They liked what they saw, they signed me up again, and I was with them for three and a half years. And unfortunately, uh, that show did close, come to an end, which was such a beautiful show, but uh, that was a terrific experience. And I've been doing this work on the road for the past, I would say, 19 years. Wow. Wow. Out of all the people, you made it into the top four as a deaf person. That is amazing. And an audition wow. 8 till 5.30, that is some perseverance. You know, when you have a desire, you just have to keep going for it. And Clearly, you have the desire to be a mime artist and work as a clown. I just can't believe uh, you had got through all that. How did you overcome all the barriers that you had standing in your way? Well, I would say the most important piece to get through barriers like that would be to maintain a positive outlook and not to get discouraged or demoralized and to believe that you can overcome no matter what the barriers are. If you have a dream or a passion, it's important to have that positive outlook. Because yeah, you know, when you're working with spoken language people, it's very challenging. And I would you know, explain to them that I was able to speak and I was able to hear, but maybe not as, as perfectly as you, but I can communicate. And I think having that attitude and dealing with a diverse cross-section of people communicating either in print or using my voice, just makes the job so much easier when you have that attitude. I would say anyone, uh, to anyone who's interested in following their dream, that they have to maintain that positive outlook. Otherwise, you know, it'll just be more difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's always going to be a challenge. You're always having to prove yourself. And it's, it's always going to be hard work, but it's important to have that positive outlook. I definitely agree with you. Uh, your outlook on something, your attitude is definitely crucial. One of our last uh, questions for now, uh, working in Cirque du Soleil and performing, you have millions of people with their eyes trained on you. How do you overcome some of your uh, emotions and perform? Well, I just think that's just part of the trade. You, you always come into a performance with butterflies and heart pounding, and I think that's part of it. Uh, you know, it's, you can't perform unless you have that energy. You have to bring that, that nervousness and, and channel it into good energy. And when you're on that stage and you're in front of the crowd, you know, you have to be able to take that energy and project it and, and bring, engage your audience in with your performance. And I, I love performing. I love performing in front of large crowds and you know, whether I'm uh, showing off or I'm talking with people, I'm always engaging and I'm always showing my artistry. So I love performance and that's just something that's been a part of me from day one. It's something that I love to do. But 
you know, you're right, when there is a large audience, and I've been in front of thousands and thousands of people, and it is an amazing experience, it's thrilling. I mean, I couldn't believe it initially when I'm thinking I have 7,500 7, people in this audience and having to project my, my passion to them. As I say, I was doing this for three and a half years at the Cirque du Soleil, and, um, and sometimes I, there would be three million people who were seeing me, so that's quite an audience. Wow, that is staggering. And the skill that you have, 7,500 people in an audience watching you. That is a lot of people with their eyes on you. Well, Very brave. Yeah, I mean, I'm just a small little speck on the stage when you're, when you're performing in front of a large audience like that. It's amazing. But when it's intimate, you know, that kind of a smaller theater, it's a different kind of energy. But when you're working with such a, with such a large theater and a large audience, and of course there's music involved, and there's animation, and there's all kinds of great stage work, and being able to uh, perform, not hearing all of the quality of sound, it's not something that you come to naturally. You have to keep working at it, and it's important to not give up. Yeah. Hmm. I just, uh, I'm awestruck to be honest. I just can't even, you know, I'm at a loss for words right now. Really, an inspiring person we have here with us today. So brave to perform in front of such great numbers of people and to just have a great attitude and get up there and do it. If I was in your shoes, I would be nervous for sure. I uh, would have to try my best though and do my performance after. I can't even imagine how relieved you would be. And I guess there's quite a feeling after you're done uh, of great success. Wow. And my last question for you here, uh, if you're in a meeting or anything like that at work, do you have interpreters? Do you mean at the Cirque du Soleil? Yes. Well, if I'm meeting with the executive, uh, yes, there would be. But when I'm on the road, um, they would provide ASL interpreters. During the uh, road trips, though, there wouldn't be anything like that. Uh, in fact, when I was in Europe, Europe I had to request an interpreter because it was just impossible to communicate via notes. I was able to have someone who used what's called an international kind of sign language and that, that seemed to be uh, more than adequate. But when I'm working at, uh, on stage and using the, uh, the, the manager's laptop, that seems to be adequate as well. The following day, we get email communications to talk about, uh, you know, let's say the meeting and a summary of the meeting, and I felt that I was included. I didn't feel that I was uh, out of the loop. I believe that it's just important to have that teamwork, and it's like the Cirque du Soleil is, in, is like a family, and they do their best, and I, will, I won't forget that experience. Hopefully, I will be able to be brought back in for another one of their uh, road trips. Bye. Okay. I feel like you will be back. Uh, I have faith that they will be calling you back. Clearly you have great skill and uh, Cirque du Soleil uh, will for sure be bringing you back in. It would be impossible for them to not bring you back, I think. I have some faith here. <laughs> and I'd be by your side trying to help you out. We'll be back soon. We'll be talking more. I have a lot more questions that I want to ask Maxim here. So I'm going to have to hold on and uh, wait to finish those off later. So right now, we'll just have a quick break. Thank you so much for joining us. To a new you. Don't settle for just being yourself. <laughs> be a new you in only minutes. Mm. Why be you when you can be me? Your before photograph. Why let someone else decide who you should be? Hi everyone, thank you again for watching. Welcome back. We are here on Courage Bacchus. So we do have Maxim here, and I'm just going to I have a few more questions. I'm wondering what you're doing right now. Well, right now I'm not working. I need a break from all that road work. It's very difficult being on the road for weeks on end, traveling 
I think I probably would be on a road trip for about 10 weeks at a time. We'd be wow. in different countries and in cities, and it was an amazing experience. But I miss home, and I miss my kids. I have two children, and I, I felt that all the time, you know. They would certainly pay the, the trip back home for two weeks at a time to spend with family, but then I had to leave again. So my kids are getting older, and as you know, kids grow fast, and I just felt it was time for me to... Yes, it was sad, and, and I'm looking at this in a positive light because it's an opportunity for me to spend time with my children. I know that I'll be on the road perhaps again, that I'll be traveling in various countries and cities, but my life today is not focused so much on what I hope to do in the future, but spending time just locally. You know, and I do have a website, and maybe through that I'll get called in to do various festivals, which I have. And I'm also teaching storytelling with Deaf Children's Society. And that's in the school for the deaf for the elementary ages. And I'm teaching them how to use their facial gestures and their body. And that's something that I can give back to kids. And it's a passion for me. And it's important that I continue to do that. So that's what I'm doing right now. Amazing. So you've traveled quite extensively. Can you tell us how many countries have you been to and where your favorite country was? In my first year, I spent in the States and I loved Hawaii. I loved being in the sun and the gorgeous area. I mean, it was great. It was a dream place to perform. After that, I traveled two and a half years throughout Europe and I've, I've touched, like I would say, all of the countries, Russia, yeah. Ukraine, Belarus, Turkey, and Israel. I would say my favorite place of all, in terms of the culture and, and the, the, the people, would be Spain. The food was magnificent, and I felt so comfortable in Spain. Italy, too, I, I really liked Israel. I liked uh, Turkey. is an amazing culture. I, I totally got into that. But the, every country has their own characteristic. Germany, I loved. I loved the Oktoberfest, and I was in Munich at that time, and there was just crowds and crowds of people, and people were dressed in their cultural, uh, traditional clothing and dancing to the music, and it was just fabulous. I mean, I loved the spirit and the energy, and every country has its own distinct culture and, and ways of being. So I have seen many different places, and I believe that, you know, we can all live as, like, one country or one peaceful community of, of citizens of the world. I believe that uh, at the Cirque du Soleil, the message that we brought on our road trips was, and I think people got that, especially in Greece and Spain, um, oh, and also in uh, Portugal, because they were going through some very difficult times economically. And every performance that we went to we had a full house. And I believe that people just needed that escape. They needed that time where they could just forget it all. And alegria, uh, in, in Spanish, it means a, a celebration. It's a time of happiness. And I believe that that was a very powerful message to give to people, that they could walk away feeling inspired. And, and that's why I did it. That's why I loved the work that I did, because I wanted to give back happiness to people. That's fantastic. Just such an inspiring story. When people are having hard times and uh, the economy is not doing well, or maybe they're having some problems, uh, personal problems with their family, but just getting out, going to a circus for a day and being happy, everyone deserves that happiness. And then getting back to the family to share their experience and talking about seeing uh, a clown working, a deaf clown working, it would just be fantastic. I wish I could have saw your performance. One day, I will have to. You'll have to let me know, and I'll make sure that I'll let all of you know so that we can watch your performance. And one thing that I have just been dying to ask, I'm hoping you can teach me a little bit of performance, just some basic skills, um, just something that I can learn. You know, a, what a first time I would learn. Do you mean miming? Yes. Well, there's the famous mime piece where it includes a door. You can't see it, but what's really important is how you use your hands. So this is how you use your hands. 
You keep your hands flat, your fingers spread apart. And make sure that when you put your hand forward, that it looks as if you're touching a hard surface. <laughs> and you do this with your face, right? I could not even do that. You are too fast, too good. So a little bit slower. Let me try this. OK, so put up your two hands and then do it again. One, two. One, two. And move them up. Move them down. Move your head to the side. Move your head to the middle. To the other side. Push your head up against and your shoulder. <laughs> You're doing great. Oh, that is a lot of fun. I hope everyone is practicing themselves. You got to practice the hands first and then bring the head in. <laughs> yeah, you did it. You got it. You got it. So why do they do that with the hands? Uh, why is that kind of the first beginner steps? Well, when you're doing mime artistry, you don't have any physical objects. And you're learning to express a physical space. And one of the first things that you can use is a artificial or a pretend space in front of you. Now, here I am opening up something. So that I'm showing you as an object in my hand, even though I don't have one there. So mime artistry is really is, a, is an art. And the reason I like it is because anyone, doesn't matter whether you use spoken language or sign language, anyone can understand what you're saying. It's an international language. And I think the same would be true for clown work. It's, uh, it's also a form of performance. And it gauges people. People understand it. People aren't restricted by a language, like a spoken language or a sign language that they, they, that they don't know. So I think that's why I like it, is because it's a universal, it's a global language. You know, anyone can understand it. Aliens. Aliens included. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I remember one performance, uh, one mime artist I had saw when I was young. I understood everything perfectly. I thoroughly enjoyed that performance. And uh, Maxim, you are great. I definitely need to practice some more here. And do your kids learn mime, street, mime artistry? Well, they know, they know a bit of it. My daughter is very good. My son is too, and I've taught them both. They both use sign language, and, but they also use spoken language, so they're fluent. And my kids are, are actors. My daughter has already been a, in a commercial when she was two and a half. Wow. So it seems to be, you know, the, the fruit hasn't fallen far from the tree. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. Your daughter, uh, already an actress. I guess it is in the family. Well, my son has also sh uh, performed in commercials as well. And I encourage them to audition for TV um, shows. And I have attended and made sure they, they had family support. And I think we are a family of actors, for sure. That's amazing. Really amazing. Yeah, what a great dad you are, a great influence on your kids. And I uh, am really looking forward to meeting your kids. I get to hopefully maybe have a little competition to see who's best. <laughs> Really looking forward to that. If you want to see more from Maxim, you can look at his website. It's www.maximmime.com. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, he also has some YouTube videos. You can take a look at some of his performances. And one of my favorite of his videos is one of his breakdancing videos. It's great. He does have a number of them on there. And that is my favorite, that breakdancing one. Just the movements uh, are mesmerizing. And the skill that he has uh, is amazing. I, growing up, I always watched breakdancing, so it's always been something I've really enjoyed. <laughs> Look, right here. <laughs> they just come so easy. Come so easy for him. I, I can't do anything like that. I think if you start uh, early, uh, you keep your flexibility, and it's uh, easier to develop those skills. So yeah, please do take a look at Maxim's website. And thank you so much for coming in today. 
uh, really, it means a lot to me. Well, thank you for asking me to be here. This has been a fantastic opportunity. I enjoyed the interview and talking to you about what I do, and I hope that more people, you know, will realize that uh, there are all kinds of deaf professionals and artists, and we are a very talented group of people. So thank you for taking this initiative and for promoting what we do as a community and as individuals. Thank you. Of course. Love ya. You too. Oh, and one last question for you. Do you have any advice for deaf youth? Uh, anyone interested in becoming a mime artist? Well, I would say that if this is, a, is something that you want to do, that you should pursue your dream. If you have the technique, you have to show it and people will recognize you. You know, the same with me, you know, I had the technique and I wanted to perform and, um, you know, I'd be happy if someone wants to contact me, I'd be happy to help in whatever way I can. And I don't mean to say that you're good, doing a good job, but I would want to be able to give uh, some feedback and to, you know, give some pointers. And I know that uh, mime artistry is not uh, a, a, a simple skill, it's a very complex skill. It's the same as ballet, you know, there's a lot of different moves and, you know, you have to practice those moves. And it's the same with uh, mime artistry. And there's all sorts of technique that, that needs to be learned and practiced. So I'd be happy if someone's interested in contacting me to work with this person. And the other thing that's really important is to not give up and to keep that positive outlook, right? Right? Mm -hmm. How long did it take you? How long did you spend learning my Marshy? Well, it would depend on the technique and also, I guess, the skill. Some, some things are learned quickly and others take more time. Okay. So, for example, the, the hand movement that I showed you, that doesn't take so long. But these other movements, the ones where I move my arms and my neck in a certain way, they take more time because your body mechanics are such that you have to get to know them and use them in a way that's consistent. It's the same thing with clown work. There are lots of challenges in there because with clown work, you know, I'm asked to incorporate voice and that also takes time to develop. Wow. Thank you so much for watching today. Make sure to check out MaximMime.com and please do tune in again. <laughs>